morning, everyone. And we welcome you to our services here, the gathering of Holiday Bible Church. We're glad that you uh, made it a priority to be here with us today to worship the Lord, because uh, that's what we're here to do, to bring honor and glory and praise to his name, both through uh, singing, praying, and preaching the word of God. Um, a couple of announcements before we get going here. Um, one is that today is our community lunch, our family lunch after the Lord's Supper. So we're having the Lord's Supper today, and then we are foregoing the Discovering God Hour, and we are doing a family lunch together over in the Fellowship Hall. If you've never been a part of that, you just stick around, go over there after the service and get some food, hang out, talk to some people. It's a good time. Uh, second thing for us to note here is that the teens Bible study will kick back in starting next week, Lord willing. Uh, we will be going through the book of James, uh, and that will be over in the fellowship hall as well. Again, so that's starting next week, though. And then the last announcement for us is that the women's Bible study will be beginning again the first Monday of August. Do I have that right? First Monday of August. Okay. All right. So... Sounds like some ladies know what's going on there, so just follow the woohoos if you don't know what's going on, and they will tell you all you need to know, or you can come up and ask me, and then I'll ask somebody else. So, let's go ahead and turn our attention now to worship. Isaiah 61, verse 10 tells us, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as the bride adorns herself with her jewels. I don't know if you'd notice that there in those verses, though. The reason of rejoicing is because the Lord God does something for the individual, right? The individual is not the one who is decking himself in salvation or decking himself in righteousness, but it is God who is doing it. And we know that's through Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and take a minute to pray to this great God who gives us such a wonderful gift. Lord, we come before you today thankful that you have given us the breath of life and in this next hour or so we get to use that breath of life to praise you god i pray for each of us here that uh, that breath that we use today to praise you would not be something that only happens today but happens daily in whatever it is we're doing wherever we're working wherever we're serving that we would be honoring you, bringing glory to your name, and proclaiming the gospel through our actions and through our words. So Lord, we thank you for adorning us in righteousness through Jesus Christ. For without him, we would be trapped in our sins, and we would be sentenced to an eternity without you. But because of Christ, we can have a right and restored relationship with you and instead dwell in peace and harmony. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you would, please stand with us to sing about this great God, the one who robes us in righteousness. He is the wonderful one. Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great 
of his greatness we see it shown through the cross and the fact that Christ's blood pays the penalty for our sins and provides us access to that great God and that's what we sing about now at the cross He reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love a flood comes flowing
are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Where all the of Christ that we can have our sins forgiven. That is the point of that song. That is the point of our gathering. That is the point of our hope in this world. We have been washed white as snow. But we're also very well aware that we get our hands dirty in this world, don't we? That sometimes what we do, what we say, the way we think, doesn't match with that cleansing. We, we fall to temptation, we choose sin, we serve idols, we fall short. And so we come to a time in our service where we want to put our attention on what God has called us to be in Christ. And allow those words to convict and remind us that we still have areas that need confession. And confession is good for your soul. And so I want to turn to Colossians chapter 3. And I want to invite you to read this with me this morning. Colossians 3 verses 12 through 16. You can see there on the screen. Let's read it together. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving to God in your hearts. Let's pray. Father, as we read this list, as we allow it to penetrate into our hearts, it doesn't take much reflection to remember and to realize that these attributes do not always show up in our lives. And the fault is not yours. The fault is not because you have not given grace. The fault is not because you have left us alone. The fault is ours. And Lord, how often this week did our compassion fail when faced with the needs, the brokenness of other people? when we were tempted and gave in to the temptation, rather than bearing one another's burdens, we simply chose to ignore them, to look the other way. Lord, instances where we were not kind. And often what happens with us is that the people who feel the brunt of our unkindness most frequently are those who are closest to us. Those we love the most and we treat them with unkindness. Our pride has raged. Rather than meekness, we have sought to control. We have sought to domineer over others. And our patience is short. Lord, perhaps we need not even go further to consider the ways in which we have struggled to forgive others as you have forgiven us. To put on love, to dwell together in perfect harmony, to allow the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts, which is a corporate calling. So Lord, for all of these things, all of these ways in which we have fallen short of your glory. We confess them openly to you. But we confess them in full hope and in full assurance that at the cross of Christ, our sins are washed away. That there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For that, Lord, we are humble and we are grateful. And we ask that you would continue to supply your grace to aid us to better reflect your glory to those around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 4.25, our scripture of assurance, says this. Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification.
Bibles to Exodus chapter 28. We have been reading through, studying through, preaching through a riveting section of Scripture. At least on the surface, it doesn't appear very riveting. Um, the last several weeks we've been Talking a lot about fine twine linen, acacia wood, gold rings, furniture, and now this morning, we get a divine dress code, right? 
try to contain your excitement. But here's what I want you to ask as we read through this, as we've seen all along, is that these sections of Scripture, though they may to us seem, I mean, let's be honest, a little boring, a little hard to follow, they're here for a reason. And it's a really important reason, and we know it's important, not only because God said it, but He's going to repeat all of this again in just a few chapters. So that a significant portion of the book of Exodus is tied up in these details. And the question we've been asking ourselves is, why? Why did God give us this? Not just once, but twice. And here's the key, the key point. That these things and these descriptions of the tabernacle and the worship process of Israel were shadows. They were pictures of the gospel. What will Messiah do? What will life with God be like? And how will God dwell with his people again? And if we want to go back to the theme that we've been using all the way through the book of Exodus, it's this. That God takes slaves and turns them into sons. In other words, God pursues exiles and seeks to dwell with them again. That's the goal of the book of Exodus. And that's the point that even these descriptive passages are leading us to. So with that, Exodus chapter 28, I'm going to read the entire chapter. All right? So read along. It'll help. Follow along with me. Exodus chapter 28, verse number 1. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful, skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make. Ready? Here's the list. A breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make a holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and of fine twined linen skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges, so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it, and be one of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. You shall take two onyx stones, and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. You shall make settings of gold filigree and two chains of pure gold twisted like cords, and you shall attach the corded chains to the settings. You shall make a breast piece of judgment in skilled work. In the style of the ephod, you shall make it. Of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen, you shall make it. I told you we read a lot about fine twine linen, all right? Hang in there. And it shall be square and double, a span it, its length, and a span its breadth. You shall set it in four rows of stones, a row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle shall be the first row. The second row, emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold filigree. 
And there shall be twelve stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the twelve tribes. And you shall make for the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold. And you shall make for the breastpiece two rings of gold, and, the, and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece. And you shall put the two cords of gold and the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. The two ends of the two cords you shall t- attach to the two settings of filigree, and so attach it in front to the shoulder piece of the ephod. You're all ready to go make this right now, I can tell, right? Be like, I got this. I know exactly where we're going. Verse 28, and they shall bind the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue so that it may lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod so that the breast piece shall not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment on his heart. And when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the the Urim and the Thummim And they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding around the opening like the opening of a garment. So that it may not tear. On its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns. Around its hem with bells of gold between them. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers. And its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out so that he does not die. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban, it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. You shall weave the coat in checkerwork of fine linen, and you shall make a turban of fine linen, and you shall make a sash embroidered with needlework, For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty. And you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. And shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. You shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. And they shall reach from hip to thigh. And they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting. Or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we seek your help this morning. We ask that you would open our minds, but more importantly, we ask that you would open our hearts. We help us, we ask that you would help us to put our faith and our confidence in your word, in your truth, and not the word of man. So God, we pray that you would lead us. We pray that your word might be quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Now, what's the point of knowing all of this detail about a priestly dress code? I mean, we don't have priests today. We, we know, like, already in our study of Exodus, the priesthood ended with Jesus. He is our great and final high priest. So why bother reading about all this detail about something that feels fairly uh, irrelevant to us. But we're so far removed from that kind of system of worship, why do we need to know what the priest dressed like? Is this here just to tell us how we should dress on Sunday mornings? You know, a nice suit and tie. The description of these priestly garments, these are beautiful, right? These are not what you would wear around camp. These are special 
They are beautiful. They are unique. They are, as God calls them, holy. Is this here to tell us that we should have holy garments to come to church on Sunday? Or is there something more? And what I want to... What I want to present to you is a couple of thoughts about what these garments were teaching the people of Israel, and by extension, what they're intended to teach us. Okay? Two things. These garments were intended to remind the people that the high priest represented God to Israel. And also that the high priest represented the people of Israel before the Lord. This man and his sons, chosen by God, by the way, did not choose this office for himself. God said, take Aaron, I have chosen him and his sons. This will be the role that he plays. He's going to represent me to the people. He's going to represent the people to me. And even the garments were there to remind them that this is what this man was here for. You notice what he says in verse number 2. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. And then look again at verse number 40. We get the same little phrase. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and for beauty. There's this interesting thing in in Uh, particularly in in Hebrew writing, it's called an inclusio. And and what that means is you state something at the beginning and then you repeat it again at the end, and and it's intended like like that statement kind of gives you the idea of the point of the entire paragraph, the entire passage. So it is no accident, I think, that God says this at the beginning of the passage and repeats it at the end of the passage. These items of clothing were for glory and for beauty. What does that mean? Well, glory is is a Hebrew word that means weighty, heavy. Uh, It's actually used, I believe, of Eli, uh, the high priest, who was said to be heavy. He was was overweight. Uh, It's the same word used in this passage. So so what what it's intending to convey is that we are ascribing or recognizing the weightiness or the importance of, or the value of something. It's heavy. It's, it's got gravity. These garments were intended to convey, maybe in our language, gravitas. I had no idea what that word meant until a presidential election a number of years ago. Like, this candidate has gravitas. This one does not. What do they mean? It's gravity, weightiness, seriousness. Beauty. We all understand beauty. We don't need to define it. But I would just point out that beauty has been a theme all the way through this section of the, about the tabernacle. I mean, we're, we're reading about gold and silver and bronze and, and beautiful fabrics and, and fine artistry going into the temple or the tabernacle. This location where, where the expression of God's glory would be most highly concentrated was full of vibrant colors, full of gold. Those same colors, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, and gold, are used specifically in the clothing for the priests. You see that all over this passage, especially verses 5 and 6. But I also want you to notice verse 33. There's this interesting little detail about, hey, you know, he's going to have this... this Uh, outer garment and around the hem of that garment I want you to alternate pomegranate bell pomegranate bell pomegranate bell all the way around the hem what's the point of that we'll get to the bells in a moment but I want to focus on the pomegranates for just a second like why pomegranates and and maybe it's just the fact that they're you know they, they would they would fit well it was a it was kind of a symbol of uh, of, of beauty itself in the ancient world. But it's also quite possible that pomegranate is itself a connection to the Garden of Eden, where man was meant to 
to keep a garden with all sorts of fruits. The, the one that rises to the top that gets mentioned the most is pomegranate. And we already know inside the tabernacle itself, there are already reminders of the garden there. There's, there's already cherubim blocking the way to the Holy of Holies, the throne room of God, just like the cherubim that were at the entrance to the garden. Just outside of that Holy of Holies, there's a, there's a candelabra that, that is shaped and in, in, in mimics a tree. Well, there's a tree in the garden that was guarded by the cherubim, wasn't there? No one should be able to enter and eat of the tree of life. The point is this. When the high priest dressed himself in his clothing, it was a picture to the people that he was representing God to them. He was a reflection of the beauty of the inner parts of the tabernacle where God dwelt. He was a reflection of the beauty in Eden where God dwelt with his people. We walked with them in the garden. He was the embodiment of the presence of God to Israel. An imperfect image, but an image nonetheless. And you remember, the people couldn't enter the tabernacle. As a matter of fact, from, from the outside, all they could see were the curtains that were about seven feet high. So as you go about your business, and, and you're making your way across the wilderness in these these tents and you're setting up camp, uh, the best you could do on any given day was look at the curtains and you would see the smoke from the altar rising and you would see the top of the tabernacle, but that's it. Until you bring your own offering in, then you get to come inside the court. You get to come to the altar. You get to eat a meal, but that's as far as you can go. You don't get inside the tabernacle. But there was the priest dressed in garments that were for glory and for beauty. Why? Because he was representative of the fact that God was with his people. But he also represented the people to God. And in this passage, there, there, we get a list in verse number four of, of six different articles of clothing. And so what I want to do, I just want to kind of go through and give a, a brief um, best we can do picture, description of what these things did and what their purpose was. There are six of them mentioned in verse number four, the breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. But then there's a bonus one that's not mentioned in the list. But it gets described in the last couple of verses, all right? So we'll hold that one as a surprise bonus at the end, which means there's a total of seven articles of clothing for the priest. Number one is the ephah. You find this described in verses 6 through verse 14. There's a lot of debate about what the ephod actually looked like, about what it actually was, but most people believe this would have looked something like an apron that would have went over the, an undergarment, with a sash or a band around it, it was tied around the waist, and it was done in the colors of the tabernacle, the, the blue and the purple and the, the scarlet. But the most important piece about this ephod were the shoulder pieces. Moses is told that on each shoulder, there should be a setting of gold that's going to hold an onyx stone, a black stone, and on each of these stones, would be engraved the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Six on one shoulder, six on the other shoulder. But why is that so significant? The image, the picture, is one of the priests who would bear the burdens of the people of God before God himself. He was bearing the burdens of the people of God on his shoulders. It was a picture of the responsibility of the priesthood. That part of what the priest does is not only represent God to the people, but he takes the people before God. He bears them on his shoulders. It's a load. It's a weight. It's a burden. But he is there to take the burdens of the people into the presence of God. 
Not only that, but there's a breast piece. The significance of the breast piece is seen in, in, a, in a couple different ways here. Uh, number one, it's listed first in verse number four. It's breast piece and ephod. Then when it comes to the description, he, he flips the order for us and he goes ephod first and then breast piece. But it's listed first. And it also gets the longest description in this passage. From verse 15 all the way to verse 30. A significant amount of time is given to this piece of clothing. Why? Well, let's talk about what it was first. The, 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 the breast piece, some, some of your, if you have an older translation, some of them say breastplate. It's not, it's not a plate, it, it's, a, it's a fabric. And apparently this fabric was a rectangle shape when it was woven, but then it would be folded over to make a square and, and in some way have a pouch inside it, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But on the outside, there would be, there would be rows of stones, 12 stones, each one again representing one of the tribes of Israel that would be engraved either on the stone or on the, the gold setting around the stone. And each one of these stones, we, you know, the, we get the list, the names of the stones. Those are kind of the, the translator's best uh, guesses as to what these stones were. Uh, it's hard to know exactly how these words in Hebrew translate into our modern understanding of gems and, and precious stones. It's kind of a, our best guess. But I would like to just point out for a moment that the majority of these stones are listed in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 28 where Ezekiel is describing what was located and what was found in the Garden of Eden. He lists off an extremely similar list of stones. And then we're going to find a lot of these stones again repeated in the book of Revelation in chapter 21, where they are found in heaven. What's the connection between these three lists of stones? I would just submit to this. The connection is that we are getting three scenes where God is dwelling with His people. He was there in the garden. He was there in the tabernacle, represented by the priest. And He will be there when heaven comes to earth. And God once again dwells with His people. So we say this often here, the Bible, folks, is telling one Unified story. It is not a bunch of disconnected stories telling us how to be good or even telling us how to find God. The point of the story of the Bible is this. It is telling us how God came to find us so that he might dwell with us. And even these rocks, even these stones are a shadow of what was to come. It was a picture of what was in Eden and an anticipation of what will be yet again. And so the priesthood is a stop along the way, reminding us of the promise of God that he will dwell with his people. But look at verse number 29. It says this, what's the point of, of these? Outside of us kind of getting this meta picture of the story of the Bible and these 12 stones, what was the point to Israel? What would have been most obvious to them? about this breast piece. And it was this, verse 29 says, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. So, so here's the picture. Not only does the priest bear the names of God's people on his shoulders, like bearing their burdens, but also he bears them next to his heart. It's a reminder, it is a visible reminder that Israel is precious to the Lord. This one, this priest who was a picture of God to the people, wore the names of those people on his shoulders and next to his heart. And these two pieces, the ephod and the breast piece, were a constant reminder that God knows the burdens of his people and he cares enough to do something about it. He would never forget his people. It's a bitter reminder, if you remember way back to Exodus chapter 2, Israel is enslaved and they're being mistreated. There's genocide going on. And in verse number 24, it said, God heard their groaning. 
God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and he knew. Looks this breast piece with all these stones and in the stones on the shoulder of the priest, they were a reminder that God does not forget his people. And what God knew moved him to action to bring salvation to Israel. Now later God would refer to the work of the priest as that of a shepherd. Those, those would tend to his people. They're tending, they're caring for sheep. And the same imagery is used in the New Testament of pastors. Pastor and, and priest, they are not the same thing. They are not. Again, priesthood has ended. We have pastors today. It is not the same thing. But the imagery used to describe some of the work of both is the same. In the Old Testament, God describes his priests as shepherds. And in the New Testament, we have pastors, which literally means shepherd. Tend my sheep. So folks, in a real sense, this is the burden of the elders of a church. It is our duty and our privilege to bear your burdens to the Lord. But I do want you to notice that the priests were not tasked with solving the burdens. They were bearing them before the Lord. There is a very real temptation, I think, both amongst those who serve as elders, pastors in a church, and those who, who, are, who are seeking by God's help to follow their lead. There's, there's a real temptation to look at those individuals and, and believe in some way that they have all the answers. And the men in those positions who begin to believe that they have all the answers will eventually end up in some way abusing the people he has intended to care for. That's not our job. It's not my role to always be right. It's not my role to have all of the answers. Should I take this job or that one? I don't know. I will pray for you. I will seek to give you godly counsel. I will hear you out. I will attempt to look for ways that I might be able to point you to Christ through the decision. You know, well, this one will cause me, like, I'll have to work every Sunday if I take this one. Well, what, what would the Lord say about that? Let's consider the options. Let's, let's weigh it out. I don't know whether to buy this house or that one. Move here or there. You know what? I don't know the answer to that question either. I might be able to come alongside and go, let's talk about the ramifications of each choice. Let's talk about the, church, the, the options of churches you might have here or there. But folks, we don't have all of those answers. Yet there are some who try to pretend like they do. As if they have all wisdom. And if they ought to be the final word of authority for all of your decisions. Listen, brothers and sisters, we're here to bear your burden. But we are derelict in our duties if we are simply giving you advice or telling you what to do rather than bearing those burdens to the Lord and directing your attention to Him. You know what I'm saying? You understand the difference? There is advice to be given, but that advice ought always be centered around how can I direct your attention to the Lord? How can I direct you to see him and to seek him? Men who enter this profession with no love for God's people are in danger of doing a great deal of damage. But listen, let me say this also. You don't have to be a pastor to bear the burdens of those you love to the Lord. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul is like, bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. In other, words, in other words, in Christ, we understand we have access. We, we are a, a royal priesthood ourselves. You bear one another's burdens. You can point each other to Christ. You can pray for one another. And so love them. This breast piece, one other thing about it, it it's called often, it's referred to as the breast piece of judgment. And the reason it's called that is because it contains two very unique and somewhat confusing stones. So you got the 12 on the outside, but then in verse 30, 
it says you should take the Urim and the Thummim and, and, and you're going to put them inside kind of the pouch. Remember I told you it's, it's like a pouch. It's got a pocket in it. And, and these, these two stones or, or whatever they were, Urim and Thummim were to go inside. And, and I'll just be honest with you, I don't know what these things are. I would love to know. They come up a few times in the Old Testament. Saul uses them once. We know what they're used for. They're used for divination. Let's, let's try and determine what God wants us to do in this given situation. But we don't, like, were, like, were they dice? Were, were they chips? Were they just rocks? Was it like a, a black one and a white one? You know, and, and whichever one you pulled out, like, like black one is no, white one is yes. But we're just not sure exactly what this is. It seems like the names themselves, Urim and Thummim, mean light and perfection, which would seem to push us in the direction of, of God. This is a way in which God is giving direction to his people. Some have suggested that maybe these two words are used because the first letter of Urim is Aleph. A little Hebrew lesson for you. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first letter of Thummim is, is the Tau, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So you have the olive and the tau, beginning and end, first and last, in Greek, alpha and omega, right? So, so maybe even in choosing the words, there is an indication that God is the author, like, like he owns all knowledge. He is the wise one. The priest didn't have all the answers, but, but there's one who does, and that is the Lord. We don't know how they're used, we don't know exactly what they were, but they were used to discern the Lord's will. Now, this raises a question for us, doesn't it? Like, why would God use this at all? I mean, I, I do not have Urim and Thummim in my pockets this morning. I, I don't have dice with me. You come and say, you know, should I ask her out? Let's find out, right? This is also not Magic 8-Ball. You remember those? Anyone? Like, kids in here, I don't know if you even know what Magic 8-Ball was, but that was, that was the stuff back in the day. Like, should I ask her out? Not likely. Right or, or whatever the answer would be. You get some, some answer that's like, yes, that's, that's my answer. Should we all expect to have like some magic eight ball from God that if we have a decision, this is how we know what the answer is? Well, let me give us a couple of thoughts about this. Number one, this Urim and Thummim are based in the certainty of God's providence. So Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 says this, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So in other words, there was a time in Israel's history where God kind of uses this system to help them make decisions where they needed clarity. And he's like, you can have perfect confidence because even when you roll the dice, the rolling of that dice is not outside of my sovereign control. And I can use that to give you directions. Second thought, these Urim and Thummim were not intended for personal use. Right? They were not a magic eight ball you could take home with you. They were used by the priest or the leader of God's people to determine specifically God's will regarding the nation or the public good. This wasn't like, you know, should I have cinnamon toast crunch for breakfast? Not all that healthy. Or, you know, brand cereal. It, it's not what this was. This was for public good, for public direction. Now, third question, why don't we use or have something like this similar today. I mean, after all, we still have questions, right? You know? There are things we would like to know, the things we'd like to have clarity on. We face a lot of uncertainty. We want to know the answers. And by the way, that's why there's such a market for psychics and palm readers and fortune tellers, because we want to know. We, we want some certainty. We're craving some certainty. Why wouldn't God give us Urim and Thummim today? Why didn't, it, why didn't it persist? Well, remember this. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse number 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. In other words, folks, everything we need to live godly, fulfilled lives on this earth has been given to us in the person of Jesus. 
We have his full and complete written word. We have the indwelling of the Spirit of God. We have the wisdom of one another and the, you know, the multitude of counselors. There is safety. You see, particularly in these first two pieces, the ephod and the breast piece, the role of the priest is representing God to the people and the people to God. The remaining five pieces we're going to go through pretty quickly. Short descriptions, okay? So, so let's go at it. The robe in verses 31 through 35. Not a, lot of, not a lot of information given here, except it was supposed to be blue in color. Have pomegranates and bells in the hem. I'm going to dispel a common misunderstanding about the bells on the hem of this coat. Because a lot of us, including myself, and I think I've helped spread this rumor at times, um, believed that there would be a rope tied around the, the, the ankle of the high priest as he went to the Holy of Holies. So if, you, if the bells stopped jingling, you went, oh, that, you know, we're like, we got to pull it out. Right? Because it's dangerous to go in there. Something went wrong. We haven't heard bells in a while. We start jerking on his foot and pull him out of the tent because God struck him dead. But there is nothing in this passage and there is nothing anywhere in Scripture that says anything about a rope on the, the foot of the high priest. As a matter of fact, we don't find that anywhere in history until somewhere around the 4th century A.D. Um, it, it kind of pops up in some writings then. But other than that, uh, it seems to be uh, something that, that simply wasn't the case. It doesn't lessen the danger, though. There were still bells, and, and the danger even in this passage is that you, you should not go in. Verse 35 says, it's sound, the sound of the bells shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out, so that he does not die. I mean, this is still dangerous work. And the jingling of the bells, it, it, it's hard to understand whether this was for the people on the outside or whether this was in some way an announcement to God that the priest was coming, not that God didn't know. But again, the picture, you, you didn't walk into the presence of a king unannounced. So, so even in the jingling of the bells, there is this reminder of the kingly presence of God amongst his people. The king has come to dwell with his people, but his presence is not to be taken lightly. There are to be bells. Announce your presence. Give indication to the people that you are about the work of the Lord on their behalf. There's a turban. Verses 36 to 38, the most important feature of this turban was the gold plate engraved with the words, holy to the Lord. As a matter of fact, this is the first thing that's described about this turban. That on it was a gold plate, and engraved on that gold plate were the words, holy to the Lord. Later, you can, uh, you can maybe flip to the book of Zechariah. Chapter 14, the, the prophet Zechariah is looking forward to a day, he says, where every pot and every bell in all of Israel and all of Judah will be inscribed with the words, Holy to the Lord. It was a reference back to the priestly garment. It was a reference to the priestly term. But there, he's looking forward to a day that was yet to come, the day of the Lord when Messiah would come. And when Messiah would come, even the common things would be holy to the Lord, not just the high priest. Verse 38 says it's to be on Aaron's forehead. And Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on the, his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. We go, why forehead? Like, why, why the emphasis on forehead? You remember, um, you remember at the trial of Jesus when, when the people who were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And, and, and Pilate says, why? What wrong has he done? And the people respond, let his blood be upon our heads. It was a fairly common phrase that indicated the guilt is ours. It's on my forehead. It belongs to me. But the inscription on Aaron's forehead is a reminder that he was representative of the people to God for their sins. They're bringing sacrifices to the one who is holy to the Lord. To have that inscribed on his forehead meant the priest was to bear the sins of the people before the Lord. 
He was the one who would make atonement for them through sacrifice. Then we get two things kind of smooshed together here. Uh, the coat, which, which we think coat like jacket, you know, we zip up. We need those about three weeks out of the year here in Florida. In case you're not familiar with those, with those, those keep you warm in the wintertime up north, right? All those places where we all learn it's best not to live, right? We just, we get out of that stuff and we come here because I don't want to wear a coat, right? Uh, but that's not what this is. This is probably, when we hear a description of the coat, this is probably the white linen undergarment that would go underneath the apron, the ephah. It would be the part that would touch the priest's skin. And then there is a sash and a cap. Verse 40 says, these were specifically for Aaron's sons. And you can imagine, like, like the sons that, that are doing the, the regular work of the priesthood don't get all of the same garments as the high priest because the work of the priest is kind of like that of a butcher. It's bloody, it's messy, it's smelly. They get kind of a reduced version of the high priest's garments. There's still a cap, still a sash, still beautiful, but a lot less ornate because the work is hard. The work is dirty. In verse number seven, or verse, seven, verse 42 and 43, we get the seventh item of clothing that wasn't listed in verse number four. This is the surprise one at the end, and that is a set of undergarments. Verses 42 and 43 is like, you are to make undergarments for the priest that go from hip to thigh. You say, why? <laughs> like, why? Why would the Lord even mention it? Well, well, here's where it's helpful to understand and remember what worship was like with the, with the countries and the people around Israel. In the worship system of the Canaanites, in, in ancient times, there was a huge emphasis on sexual activity. When you would go to visit a temple, when you would go to make sacrifice, there were priests and priestesses who would seek to engage in sexual activity with the people coming to make the sacrifice. The reason that was the case is because they believed that, that when the gods saw them engaging in that activity, that it would spur the gods on to be engaged in sexual activity, and that would result in better crop yields and more rain, better fertility for my animals and, and for you know us as people. But God does not allow such thinking at all. There will be no such thinking that when you come to my temple, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. As a matter of fact, I want there to be such covering that it is not even questioned. There can't even be accidental, right? Everything is covered. The possibility of nakedness is removed in his service. There is a covering of the shame of nakedness. And then we get again in verse 40, these garments were for glory and beauty. It's a lot of descriptions. It's a lot of words. And the reality is it, it's impossible to know exactly what this thing looked like. But the exact picture of what it looked like really isn't important. What really is important is what are they telling us? <laughs> Hebrews tells us that these things were a shadowy picture of the realities that would become in the gospel. They were arrows pointing us towards something better. They showed the weightiness, the glory of the office of the priest. They were beautiful, representing the presence of God. And they were holy, set apart for God's own use. And the men who wore them were to be holy. But you know what? Those men failed. As a matter of fact, they failed so badly in their duties that God just brought the priesthood of Aaron and his sons to an end. They themselves were unholy. They failed to uphold the glory of the office. They failed to display the glory of God in anything but their garments. Their lives and their leadership were often dirtied by their own sin. As a matter of fact, a couple of chapters... It, we don't even make it away from Mount Sinai. Like Aaron is going to have the garments made. He is going to be the representative. And what is the first thing we find him doing with those garments? It's the golden calf. The priesthood of Aaron from the beginning, in that sense, was a failed priesthood. They could not live up to the inscription on their own foreheads. Holy to the Lord. 
Zechariah. We go back there again. So it was like, man, these, these you know, minor prophets in the Old Testament, what are those all about? Well, here you go, all right? We already looked at Zechariah 14. Now I want us to consider a vision that Zechariah has in chapter 3. In chapter 3 of Zechariah, he has a vision of the high priest in his day whose name was Joshua. And in this vision, Joshua is standing before the Lord and he is filthy. His garments were filthy. He was the representative of God's people, which means the people were filthy. The high priest was filthy, and standing there next to Joshua, the high priest, was Satan himself. And what was Satan doing? Satan was doing what Satan always does. He is accusing the brethren. He is accusing Joshua before God. I imagine it with something like this. This is your man, God. This was your choice. This is the one who's supposed to represent you on earth. Your glory, your beauty. Look at him. He's a mess. He's a failure. He deserves to be judged for blaspheming your name. Look at him. And you know what? Satan had a point. But here's what Zechariah sees next. The angel, in response to Satan, rebukes Satan, and then he says this. He looks to those who are standing before him, and he says, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. In other words, the angel takes the filthy, dirty rags that Joshua was wearing and he begins to clothe them in clean, priestly garments like the ones we just read about. And then Zechariah does something really unexpected. Zechariah pipes up and, and says, don't forget the turban. Don't forget the turban. And, and I think this is meant to take us by surprise. Like There are some things in the scripture where we're supposed to go, whoa, didn't expect that. He, he's got this picture of God, the throne, this accusation. You expect Zechariah is dumbfounded, but Zechariah pipes up and says, let them put a clean turban on his head. <laughs> oh, did I say that? He's like the eager child. like He knows what's coming, and he can't keep it in anymore. Yeah, do it. Why was he so excited about a hat? Why was he so excited about a turban? They made him just blurt out to the angel, don't forget. Why? Because that turban, with that insignia, was the definitive declaration that Joshua, in spite of his sins, in spite of his failures, in spite of Satan's accusation, was holy to the Lord. Zechariah was waiting for the climactic moment, the final piece, the placing of the turban on the head, and the final blow to Satan's accusations. And folks, isn't that what we all need? Isn't that what we all, isn't, isn't what we really need? Because we have a keen sense of our dirtiness, of our filthiness. We, we, we try to hide it, we try to pretend like it's not there, but it's there. It's gnawing away at us. It's gnawing away. We feel it, we sense it, and even when it's not obvious, it's still there. It's there in, in your just insatiable desire for success. It's there in your insatiable desire for acceptance and love. Because all of those things tell us of a deep-rooted dissatisfaction that we are very familiar with the fact that deep inside of us, we are not okay. And we're clamoring for answers. We want security. We, we, want, we want bank accounts. We want certainty. I want to know what's going to happen. By the way, no, you don't. Right? You think you do, but you don't. We clamor for these things. Why? We might be confused at the answer, but God is not confused. The answer is not that I need more money, bigger bank account, more popularity, greater power, more beauty. What I need is a cleanness that doesn't come from me. What I need is to be washed and made holy by some way outside of myself. Because I can't get there. 
I can't do it. Listen to Isaiah 61.10. This is how we started our service this morning. The, 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 the prophet says, I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall exult in my God. Why? Because he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's covered me with a robe of righteousness. Like a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. What was on the headdress? Holy to the Lord. We go, how is it possible? How is it possible that someone so dirty, so unworthy, could be declared holy to the Lord? Well, you see, we have a high priest. Just like Israel did. But our high priest was never plagued by his own sin. He was perfect. And he, in his perfection, entered into the throne room, offered himself as the final perfecting sacrifice so that, Hebrews tells us, 725, consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He saves us to the uttermost, every part of us, all the way, because he lives to make intercession. Guess what that means? Guess what it means that he ever lives to make intercession for you? You know what it means? It means he bears your name into the throne room. He takes your name on his heart into the throne. And you know what he says when he's there? Says, yeah, they're dirty. They're guilty of sin. They've messed up. Sometimes again and again. They're impatient with each other. They have a hard time forgiving. Sometimes they're not very kind. They can be reluctant to bear the burdens of their brothers and sisters, but their holiness does not come from them. Their holiness comes from me. I have declared it so. I have credited my holiness to their account. And I took the burden of their sin. And I paid it all. I paid it all. Folks, this is the kind of God we serve. We have a great high priest who has entered where we could not go to do what we could not do so that we might be saved to the uttermost. Not with our effort, but by our faith in his effort alone. We can be clothed. We can put off the old self and put on the new. Let's pray together. Before I pray, we're going to We're going to participate in the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. So I, I want to begin pointing us in that direction. And I want to give us all a few moments just to, just to maybe prayerfully reflect on the things that you have heard. And I will say this. If you need to talk, we are here to talk. This conversation about a perfect high priest who was able to make you righteous and perfect and holy is maybe new to you. Or something you would like to discuss further, please, please come find something. We would love to share with you more about what that means. And what we're going to do in a few moments is gather around a table with cracker and some juice those things are going to be a reminder for us of the work that our high priest has done. His body being broken. His blood being spilled. So that we might be made righteous. Part of his family. But Paul also tells us before we come to this table, we should examine ourselves. We should look inside. And see if there are things that perhaps we might need to confess. We ought to put our minds on Christ because we do this to remember him. So let's take a few moments, silent reflection, and let's do just that.
thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I thank you for the body of Christ that was torn through which we gain access to the throne room of God. Lord, we pray that you would keep him ever before us who is the author and finisher of our faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us just a word of explanation. Uh, just a moment, we're going to sing the song that the pianist is playing. And as we do, we're going to stand together. That's going to be your invitation that the, the bread and the cups are in the back. They're, they're stacked together. It's a little different maybe than what you're used to this morning. But the invitation is going to be open to you. If you are in Christ, if Christ is your high priest, your savior, then you are welcome to join us in this meal this morning. If that's not you, then, then our encouragement is you just stay seated. Um, it's for your good. It's it's uh, something we participate in together again as a family. No one's taking count of who's going and who's not. No one's looking. Uh, so if you uh, if that's not your testimony, then you are welcome to stay where you are. For those of you who that is your testimony, the invitation is open to you to come and join us, and then we will participate together. But as we sing, the invitation is open to head to the back and grab those cups.
Received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25 says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Folks, thank you for joining us. We're going to sing here in just a moment, um, and then we'll be dismissed. But just a reminder, we do have lunch next door. We would love for you to join us for that fellowship uh, in the body of Christ, around a table. And uh, uh, it's an important part of who we are uh, as the people of God, the family of God. Lord bless you. Thank you for coming. Let's stand, and we'll sing together one last time. Yes, please stand with us. We will sing together the chorus of I Want to Know You. Okay, here we go. I probably need a pick for this. Sorry, guys. I want to know. missed. We'll see you over in the fellowship hall for our gathering.